Hello. About a month and a half ago, I asked you to build some off-road vehicles for a contest on my Discord server, and as promised, here's the video going over them. For those who don't know, this is the example car I made for the contest. I got two videos out of the build, one for the automation half and one for the J-beam half where I animated the suspension. This third video, though, gets back to the contest I introduced in the first video, namely this is the testing and results. Instead of being about my car, it's about all of yours, so let's take a look at those. We'll go in order of submission, so we'll start with this big Dakar truck made by Patrick Bird 27 It's the most powerful entry to the contest with 750 horsepower, but thanks to the power-to-weight ratio rule I set, it's also the heaviest at nearly 7,000 pounds. It is very sponsored, unofficially of course, and kind of battery-like in its appearance. As you will soon discover, it's also one of many 4x4s entered in this contest. By the way, the reason we're suddenly in a different map for these b-roll shots is that, as it turns out, having 8 cars spawned, that is 7 entries plus my own car, is very laggy and I got tired of recording everything in slow motion. Anyway, next up is Rowan's entry. This is a pickup truck lifted something like 50 miles off the ground with wheels about 10 feet tall. Or something like that anyway. I'm bad at estimating. It's reasonably powerful at 574 horsepower, and it's another 4x4. Also, although I'll try to avoid tangents like this whenever possible, I am after all trying to give roughly equal attention to each submission, I really like the effort that's gone into the grill and headlight surrounds. Very nice. Genji's entry is next, and it's quite normal for an entry to an extreme off-road contest. Nonetheless, it qualifies, because I am desperate for entries. This is the first of a couple surprising all-wheel drive drivetrains. The contest rules give different power-to-weight limits depending on the number of driven wheels, so if some lunatic decides to make a rear-wheel drive off-roader, they might have a bit more of a chance. However, this doesn't differentiate between 4x4 and all-wheel drive, so by choosing the latter you are simply losing low range with no real benefit. Still, with a relatively reasonable amount of power, and therefore a relatively reasonable weight, We'll see how this does. Next is my friend Setz's entry, a gigantic 4x4 trial truck. Setz has a thing for making 3D bodywork trucks, my amphibious truck was a modified version of one of his, and so literally nobody was surprised when he submitted this thing. I could elaborate on specs, but who cares? That doesn't seem all that interesting when you think about how Setz built this from scratch with a bunch of rectangles and circles and such. Okay, a moment ago I said the two-wheel drive power-to-weight rule was to make life a little easier for lunatics who want to make rear-wheel drive off-roaders. Soup, being a lunatic, has done exactly that. This buggy, featured on Automation's social media recently, looks more like something out of Mad Max than any recognizable car it would have canonically started as, and as usual for Soup, who is my collaborator for this hypercar, he's gone insane with details. There's a reason it's the car I used for the intro. Next up is the Velocity Disruptor by Spilt Destructor 2. I suspect there might have been some typos there. And though it's not our most powerful vehicle today, it's by far the torquiest, surpassing even Sez's trial truck with a formidable 1,394.9 pound-feet of torque. It's another all-wheel drive entry, but with that much torque, I don't think the lack of a low range will matter. Oh yeah, by the way, you think these are snorkels? Nope, exhaust. Finally, Recon's entry, or Reckon's? I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry. Other than Soup's buggy, this is the lightest vehicle here, but it's also the least powerful and has the least torque even including Soup. Not great for rockier terrain, but the lower weight should help its handling and the higher speed testing will do. It kind of reminds me of a Dakar car I made years ago during the text commentary dark ages of my channel. Anyway, that's all the entries. Let's start testing them. We'll start with the big off-road circuit in Johnson Valley, which I've had to make my own time trial for because for some reason it doesn't already have one. 
It should be a pretty good test of mid-speed handling as well as of suspension durability. This track has some pretty big jumps, and though it's a significantly shorter layout than I could have chosen, it's a two-lap test. For this test, particularly since I haven't driven the vehicles yet and need to get used to them, I'm going to give each one several takes, enough to get an okay-ish run. Then, the vehicles will be ranked by their times and scored accordingly. I'll start with Sets' trial truck. The suspension is really very well suited to this kind of thing, so I get to throw caution to the wind and just send it over the first few jumps. Being a big trial truck, it's no surprise that it's a bit top-heavy in the opening chicane. It doesn't have too big an impact on the overall handling, though. The suspension continues to basically ignore most of lap 1, but around the start of the second lap, the truck decides to demonstrate something I'd already discovered at the start of the first couple takes. It loves to stall. I'm not sure why this is, maybe something to do with the bigger wheels, but since I got it started up again fairly quickly, I'm going to leave it in the lap. We're aiming for decent laps here, not perfect. It's not all that great at turning, whether at high speed or low speed, but thanks to the beefiness of its suspension, I'm feeling pretty good about its time, more or less. Not that I'll reveal it until all the cars are tested. Next in line is Genji's not-so-extreme off-road car. It feels decently fast to start out, but it's really held back by its lack of suspension travel, which makes these jumps very dangerous to take at speed. The car has a tendency to slide in corners, and at this banked hairpin it actually catches and rolls over. It lands on its wheels though, so we'll keep going. I do actually really like how it handles for the most part. It's very easy to control, at least on flat ground. It kind of reminds me of a rally car. The brakes leave a bit to be desired, not because they don't work well, but because they work too well, they make the car very unstable, particularly going into the final corner of lap 1. Lap 2 is uneventful, and so we cross the finish line, launch the car and brake physics a bit, and move on to Patrick Bird's Dakar truck. This truck is insanely top-heavy. In the first few takes I rolled it just landing some of the jumps, let alone the chicane, which I have to take annoyingly slow well below the theoretical limit of grip. The suspension is very capable, just like Sets's, but I can't make the most of it because a hard landing could bounce the truck onto its side. For once though, I'm glad for an automatic transmission. I can't hear the engine at all, so there's no chance I'd be able to shift by ear. The combination of- wait, hang on, almost rolled there. The combination of automatic transmission, little or no engine sound, and almost non-existent force feedback mean that I feel kind of disconnected from the truck, making my driving even more imprecise than usual. Still, I think it'll set a fast time just on the strength of its suspension and its relatively consistent if slow handling. On to the next vehicle. Recon's SUV is straight up terrifying. Its engine is shrill and deafening, and its suspension, well. As you can tell, not exactly stable. It handles pretty well on flatter ground, it's actually a very easy car to drive, but the car bounces around as if inside a pinball machine when I drive over a bump, so I have to go frustratingly slow for the jumps. There was actually a little bit of behind-the-scenes trouble with this car, because it has some extremely terrible traction control, which is on by default. If left on, the car will barely move. To end the run, the suspension gets a bad bounce that sends the car around the finish line into the barrier, and then rebounding back to the finish again. Probably not a huge time loss though, and we'll see how its time compares to the others later. Rowan's truck is slow in both straight lines and corners, but what it lacks in speed, it makes up for in consistency. It has the handling to take all of the jumps flat out, the track width to stay stable, and some very nice handling. It's probably the easiest car so far to drive here, and thanks to its stable handling and predictable suspension behavior, I'm pretty sure it's going to have a fast time. It's let down a little bit by its automatic gearbox, which seems to always manage to be in the wrong gear, but aside from an awkward landing in lap 2, everything goes pretty smoothly. Soup's buggy is the next to last vehicle to run here, and it's got some pretty interesting handling. 
be rear wheel drive, a phrase I have got to stop writing in this script because I cannot enunciate it, it's not particularly stable off-road. This is not helped at all by its greater power to weight ratio than the rest of the entries, so I'm pretty much having to counter steer at least slightly all of the time. Worse is the force feedback. For some reason, Soup's buggy has some extremely strong and rattly force feedback, which is both deafeningly loud and not super accurate. Occasionally it will just yank the wheel in a seemingly random direction, which when combined with the oversteer means the car is difficult to keep under control. That said, the challenge makes it by far the most fun car to drive so far, and while I'm not sure how fast this time will be, it's been a very enjoyable one to set. Finally, Spilt Disruptor's Velocity Disruptor. It's almost impossible to convince the Disruptor to go where you want it to. Its suspension is very boaty, and it's just generally imprecise. You really have to aim this car rather than steering it. It actually took me several takes to learn that I have to kind of set up for corners well before the car gets to them. Its suspension is cursed with plenty of rebound, though not as bad as Recon's pinball machine, and so as it approaches the finish, sounding near death the entire time, I'm not all that confident in its time. So, how did these cars actually do? Well, first place goes to Genji's Unextreme Land Cruiser, which despite its nearly non-existent suspension travel and even a roll in lap 1 set a blisteringly fast 208. Next is Sets, whose trial truck sets a high 209 thanks to its beefy suspension. It's really the opposite of Genji's car, so it's nice to see variation this early in the leaderboard. Rowan's slow but steady lifted pickup makes it into the 210s, while Patrick Bird's Dakar truck overcomes its high center of mass and manages a 213. Recon's pinball SUV barely edges out Spilt Destructor's Bodhi Disruptor, both setting low 217s, and Soup's buggy is stuck in last place with a disappointing but fairly predictable 225. Things won't get better for our rear-wheel drive underdog, though, because next is the whole reason 4x4 is so popular. The rock crawling test. I picked out this rock crawling route on some random Johnson Valley mountain, and it's going to be very tricky. After driving over a field of rocks at the start, our contestants, or, well, me, but driving their cars, will have to make it over these two big ledges, something even my own buggy can't do. From there, it's just an ever steeper crawl up the edge of the mountain. Points are awarded based on who gets the furthest. Time doesn't matter, and I'll drive each car until it breaks or gets stuck. Since learning the course is still a factor, we'll give our underdogs a chance to catch up by running in the leaderboard order, starting with our first place car. I'm not confident with Genji's car. It's low, its suspension has little travel, it doesn't have diff locks or low range, but let's see what it can do. As expected, it scrapes the rocks even in this first section, and I suspect that's going to be a big issue going forward. It manages to claw its way over to the first ledge, and this is a huge problem as well. You see, not only is the ledge tall, but the car is having trouble getting its wheels spinning. The only way to get it moving reliably is to rev the engine up and dump the clutch, a trick that's a bit of a pain for me to do since it requires pressing all three pedals at once and trying not to roll backwards in my office chair. I really need locking casters. Eventually, by going the other way around the first ledge, I managed to climb it, but the clutch is overheating, and since it's the only way to get the car moving, I see a clutch death in the near future. With a little effort, it clambers its way over ledge 2 and goes a decent distance further up the mountain, but sure enough, the inevitable happens. While on a steep section a little further up, the clutch lets go. Definitely a valiant effort from a car so poorly suited for rock crawling, though. I'd be very proud of that. Next up is Setz's truck. It has a huge ride height, as well as both diff locks and a low range gearbox. If the unextreme off roader made it that far, I have high hopes for the green trial truck. 
We're off to a pretty good start, but that stalling issue soon presents itself once more. Ah well. Start it up again, stall again, put it in low range, and now it's time for that look. Wait, what? Okay, that was not at all expected. The front wheel has snapped off for no reason. I tried disconnecting the front drive shaft to allow the truck to move again, but I can't get traction from the rear wheels. I actually ended up doing a second take after this in case it was a fluke, but no, it broke a wheel in the same place there, so I guess that's that. That's a big letdown. Okay, Rowan's next. I'm concerned about this truck's automatic gearbox, which definitely slowed it down last round. Its wide track width and high ride height should help it here, though. It doesn't have much force feedback, but I actually prefer that for rock crawling. The alternative is a constant deafening rattle from my obnoxiously noisy G29. Good news though, this thing's great at rock crawling. It barely notices the rocks at the start, ignores the ledges, and leaves me with very little to comment on to make this actually interesting. Pretty soon it's climbed past where Genji's clutch overheated, and it just keeps going. Particularly once I remember to put it in low range, it's great at climbing steep slopes. I wish I could show you all of the obstacles it drives over, but I don't want to write enough commentary for that, so we'll just settle on this. It goes so far that it beats my original intended ending point for the climb, and eventually it finally rolls over near the top of the mountain on a section that is no longer even a trail, but just rocks. That's going to be a hard one to beat. Patrick Bird's Dakar truck is next, and though I was initially quite worried about it rolling, it quickly becomes apparent that that is the least of its problems. The wheelbase is way too long for this. It makes it over the first ledge, but it does so really more by dragging than by crawling. After a couple tries at climbing the second ledge, it makes like the other large truck in the competition and snaps a front axle. I think the bigger wheels are creating too much leverage on the axle, so a harder awkward impact just breaks it. I try unlocking the front differential, which does create traction, and promptly rolls the truck. Ah oh well. The pinball machine is next, and I'm very worried about its suspension. It nearly rolls almost immediately, but other than getting beached once or twice, the rest of the approach to the first ledge goes relatively smoothly. Using as much momentum as possible, I managed to get Recon's car over the first ledge in just one try, but the same is not true of the second. The car has neither the ride height to avoid getting beached, nor the traction to just drag itself over the rocks anyway, and I managed to get it over ledge 2 only with the force of sheer willpower. After struggling its way further up the hill, getting stuck on almost every rock I try to drive it over, the car finally reaches the point where Genji's unextreme off-roader killed its clutch. It makes a pretty admirable effort, but eventually a sudden burst of traction flips the car over. I'm honestly quite impressed though, this is just past where Genji's car died, giving it a solid second place in this round so far. Our penultimate car to try the rock crawling course is the Velocity Disruptor. It doesn't have diff locks or low range, but it has a decent ride height that might help it. Let's see how it does. As it turns out, its tires are pretty fragile. It loses first the front left, and then the rear left in quick succession, which won't help its traction at all. It also stalls out like Sets' trial truck several times, and the ESC or diffs, I'm not sure which, maybe both, start to lose their minds. 
It falls over, but that was an awful line on my part, so to give Spilt Destructor's car the benefit of the doubt, I node grabber it back onto its wheels to try again. After struggling for a good 30 seconds to even get the car lined up, I make a couple attempts at the ledge, killing the remaining tires in the process, only to get beached with a rock under the front end. Now, the rest of the cars I've gotten beached have been able to get loose, either by reversing, steering to find traction, or whatever else. The Derupter, though, has all four of its tires burst, so it just can't pull itself free. And so, we get another surprisingly disappointing showing from a seemingly capable car. Finally, it's Soup's turn. This buggy is doomed from the start. It's low, its wheelbase is very long relative to its ride height, and its rear-wheel drive, but worst of all is this front collision box, which will get the car stuck on anything bigger than a piece of gravel. I honestly don't see this even making it to the ledge, but hey, at least it has a rear diff lock. Sure enough, it's caught on some rocks almost immediately. A different line and some momentum gets it past, but this is not a good sign at all. In fact, it gets stuck quite a lot, including on the rear collision mesh when driving off of a rock near the end of the first section, but with some work, it's made it to the first of the two big ledges that have killed about half of the entries so far. Well, let's see what happens. I have no words. Or, well, I do actually, because this is post-commentary and I wrote a script, but I was absolutely shocked to have managed the first ledge so easily. Not wanting to waste this small miracle, I take my time lining up for the second ledge, almost falling back down in the process, and after a near roll, I end up climbing the car up the stack of rocks to the left. Momentum is this car's friend, and I manage to launch it almost all the way over, but it's too far to the side, and while trying to turn it back around, I accidentally hit the reset button on my wheel. Now, the car had not taken any mechanical damage that I'm aware of, and as such I think it's still fair to just respawn the car right about where it was when I hit the button, since it wasn't a natural failure. It's not ideal, but since the reset was my own fault, not the car's, like when I rolled Spilt Destructor's SUV, I consider this the most fair way of doing things. As it turns out, the car's creating its own issues anyway. See this impact? Notice how the front left wheel seems to have a bit of positive camber now? Yeah, it's not supposed to look like that. Now, thanks to both the bent wheel and just not having enough traction, the car can't really drive in a straight line, and that's really bad for a steep uphill loose surface section like we're at now. There are another 10 minutes in the recording of this run, and I'm not going to go over it all in detail. Suffice it to say, it's kind of two steps forward, two steps back. Many times I make it a decent way up the trail, muscles aching thanks to the strong force feedback, only to go flying off to the side or turning around and rolling down the hill or whatever and ending up back where I was. The front wheel's bentness progresses until it's not just a hindrance, but pretty much makes further progress impossible, and so it's only a matter of time before the inevitable happens. The car gets stuck. It was bound to happen eventually. Still, the buggy has more than defied expectations, and that is really better than anyone could have reasonably hoped for. I'd say this is the best showing on the rock crawling course by far, given the many handicaps Soup's buggy has. Okay, let's see how these cars did. Roan's truck obviously gets first in this challenge, having gone probably over twice as far as any other entry thanks to its stable suspension and great traction. Recon's pinball machine, surprisingly enough, gets second place here. It struggled a bit, but apparently far less than most of the other entries. Genji's car gets third, held back by his clutch, but otherwise about the same story as Recon. Soup shockingly gets fourth place, a solid middle of the pack spot for a car that should by all reasonable estimates have been last. I genuinely have no idea how the buggy managed this, but what I'm learning here is that rock crawling is not an exact science. Patrick Bird's Dakar truck has to settle for 5th place, having lost a wheel, followed very closely by both Sets and Spilt Destructor, who are tied for 6th, both with unlucky mechanical failures.
This is what the leaderboard looks like after combining the points from the first two rounds. Okay, just one test left. This is a short point-to-point -point race with some seriously punishing terrain. There are plenty of nasty bumps, rocks everywhere, a sandy section. It's really hard on cars, including my buggy, which after bending a wheel on a landing early on ends up grip rolling in the sand on the outside of one of the higher speed turns. I'll run the cars in leaderboard order again, meaning Rowan's pickup goes first. As it turns out, the wide, high suspension that helped Rowan so much in the first two tests kind of holds the truck back here. It's a bit too wide for this awful early jump that will become a bit of a recurring character in this test, and it's too high to be entirely stable on some of the bumps later in the course. Its handling is a little imprecise at high speed, although that's to be expected for an off-roader. You'll notice I take the final section very slowly since I'm trying to avoid rolling or launching the car on these nasty bumps. Overall, this doesn't feel like a very fast run, but on the other hand, it survived, which is more than I can say for my buggy. Genji's on Extreme Off-Roader is next, and although its low ride height was not as big of an issue for the rock crawling as I thought it would be, it's definitely a big problem here. As you can see, it's having difficulties with the uneven terrain doing its own pinball machine imitation at the start of its run. On the bright side, though, it has decent handling in the high-speed middle section, and it probably makes up some time here. The last section has to be taken not just slow, but agonizingly slow, demolishing the respectable pace it had built up earlier, so I'm definitely worried about where it'll land on the leaderboard. Recon's car is up next, and if Genji's car had a bad time, I think the pinball machine might just end up launching itself to space. Sure enough, I have to drive way slower than the car is theoretically capable of, because every bump has a risk of bouncing the SUV onto its side. The pinball machine bumpers its way into the third section, uh, sorry for that, pinball puns are very difficult to make, and is forced to slow down even further, bouncing and two-wheeling its way slowly towards the finish. It eventually reaches the all-too-short level ground of the final straight and crosses the line in style. Patrick Bird's Dakar truck is next, and it quickly becomes apparent that it's way too big for this course. At some points, the truck's track width roughly equals the width of the trail. The suspension does a great job of absorbing most of the bumps, but because of the ever-present danger of rolling, I can't make the most of it. The truck goes wide and nearly misses a checkpoint in the middle section, and the rear end kicks up entering the bumpy final third, but overall it's a clean run, and the Dakar truck is the most comfortable vehicle here so far. That might change, though. Sensa's truck is next, and it's my prediction for the fastest time because of its sturdy but stable suspension. The trial truck manages a very clean jump at the beginning since its suspension allows it to take this crazy angle safely, but it too suffers due to its size, taking up too much space on the screen and making it difficult for me to see. It runs slightly wide at this corner in the final section, which is sort of a hidden danger. The rest of the corners here have bankings, but if you run wide here, it's straight into some rocks that can burst tires or bend axles. Despite a bit of understeer in the final section, Setsa's trial truck makes very good pace, and I'm feeling good about this run overall. Soup's rear-wheel drive buggy returns now, and in theory this is exactly the sort of thing it's suited for. In practice, maybe not so much. For one thing, the force feedback rattles are awful. I didn't record anything from my microphone while recording this run, but here's a heavily edited outtake from the suspension tutorial video to give you an idea. I'm using a wheel with force feedback, and if I start driving, it kind of shudders a bit, but it's fine. But when I hit a bump, it gets quite loud. And it's definitely louder than it would be from. That's horrible. 
yeah, it's about that loud. It's actually so loud that I had trouble shifting because I couldn't hear the game over the rattling. On the handling side, it's not great either. It's gotten to the middle section by now, and it loses a ton of speed here because it can't get any traction, and is bogged down in the sand. It struggles its way through the ending section, barely keeping it straight, and although it's definitely the most fun to drive, I have no delusions about this being a fast time. Finally, Spilt Destructor's SUV stalls. Let's give it another take. The Velocity Disruptor needs a lot of caution on the bumps here, and is very, very boaty at high speed. Its boaty suspension means the car goes quite wide in the sandy middle section, but I managed to recover it and carry on to bounce around the third section, slowly, and finish the run. Okay, let's check the leaderboard again. Surprisingly enough, Rowan's truck gets another win with a 101. Apparently the slow and steady approach is working out very well for them. I was mostly right about Sets' trial truck. It's not first place, but it's close, and it was indeed a very fast time. Third place goes to Patrick Bird's Dakar truck with a 105. Despite the top heaviness, the suspension has served it very well. There's a pretty big split here before a highly contested 4th place 9 seconds later, but Genji's unextreme off-roader takes it with a 1.14.18, barely half a second faster than Spilt Destructor's car. Less than a second behind them is Recon's SUV. A good chunk of the vehicles in this third test tried to imitate the pinball machine, but none could match the original's bouncy suspension. And then we have to wait another 5 seconds for Soup's Buggy, let down by the thing that makes it so much fun to drive. Although, for what it's worth, this was indeed the most engaging entry to drive here. After all beam testing is done, the leaderboard looks like this, with Rowan, Genji, and Sets on the podium, but we're not quite finished. As someone who seems to be good at nothing but aesthetics in automation, I of course always score styling in contests, and so I made a poll to get a relatively democratic judging process for this. I hate the really clunky nature of having to splice this in at the end, but it's not like I can show you footage of people actively filling out the form, so yeah, let's just go to the final leaderboard. Having absolutely dominated two of the three beam rounds, as well as done fairly well in the styling vote, it's no surprise that Rowan gets a well-deserved first place here with an incredible 18 points and change. Sets comes second, three and a half points down. Sets got second place in two of the beam rounds and the poll, and because Rowan wasn't as consistent, Sets probably would have won if not for that unfortunate axle break in the rock crawling test. Third place is Genji's. On extreme or not, their land cruisery car punched far above its weight in the beam tests, despite its low ground clearance. Podium's not bad, and given its shortcomings, this was a very impressive effort. Soup's car in fourth place is full of weird little contradictions. When I started figuring out specifics for this contest, I assumed that rear-wheel drive entries, of which there turned out to be only one, would be reasonably competitive everywhere but the rock crawling course. Turns out that's not the case, Soup's Buggy got last place in every test but rock crawling, and also happened to easily win the styling pole, giving Soup a nice solid middle of the leaderboard finish. Recon's pinball machine ends up in 5th place. The suspension that earned it that nickname held back what would otherwise probably be a very competitive car, but it still managed to hold its own in several rounds, particularly the rock crawl where it got 2nd place. A disappointing finish, but still perfectly respectable. Sixth place goes to Patrick Bird's Dakar truck, which had some of the best suspension in the contest, but simply has too high a center of mass for its own good. Still, it's not a bad showing, having gotten third place in the point-to-point -point race because the suspension handles the bumps so well. And finally, the Velocity Disruptor is in 7th, but if I were Spilt Destructor I wouldn't feel too bad. Most of its problems had more to do with the quirks of auto beam exporting than anything else. Its uncooperative traction control and diffs are entirely the exporter's fault since you can't tune them, as are the fragile tires in the rock crawling test. 
Not to mention, the off-road preset and automation tuning is very misleading, usually resulting in a bouncy and understeery car rather than a capable off-road racer, through no fault of the car's builder. Okay, that's all I've got for you. This contest did pretty well, so I'll probably run another one at some unknown point in the future. If you want to enter that and have your car featured in the results video, provided there are enough entries to justify one, please join my Discord server using the link in the description. For now though, thanks for watching and goodbye.